Failure is not an option. Boy, I wish someone had said those words to me in high school. It would have made my teenage years a lot less painful. Hi, I'm Mike Siegel. I'm an astrophysicist. I write for Ordinary Times, and this is The Throughput. So it's been a while since I did one of these deep dives, but this is one that I've been hinting at and talking about for a while. We're finally going to get to it. I'm talking, of course, about the 1995 film Apollo 13. This, of course, is based on the real-life Apollo 13 mission, which was supposed to be the third mission to land on the moon, but had a catastrophic failure uh, midway through the mission and had to make an emergency return. And it seemed like for a long time they weren't going to make it. I, of course, was not alive at that point, but my parents remember it and remember that it was actually really uncertain whether those astronauts would come back. I mean, we're watching a movie, so we know in our hearts that it did. But uh, in real time, when it happened, this was a very scary event. It's tricky to try to recreate that sort of thing in a movie and maintain the tension and realism. But I think they did an excellent job. Now, this will be a little different from what I usually do. Apollo 13 is one of the most relentlessly documented events that has ever been committed to film. And so you could go through every minute of this film and find little things they changed, little inaccuracies, discrepancies between the official record and what they're showing in the movie. I'm not going to bore you with that, and I don't want this video to be eight hours long. What I'm probably going to do is go through several concepts that they sort of gloss over, comment on a few things, and note a few things that they change for dramatic reasons in the movie and so forth. But it actually does stick pretty close in the beats and the principles to what actually happened on the mission. So you're not seeing a, a very fictionalized version here. You're seeing something very close to the truth. One of the cool things about this movie is that the transcripts of the Apollo 13 communications are online. So in this video, we're going to actually compare what was said in real life to what is said in the movie so you can see how accurate or inaccurate it is. So let's just dive right in right at the beginning. After trailing the Russians for years with our manned space program, and after that sudden and horrible fire on the launch pad during a routine test that killed American astronauts Gus Grissom, Ed White, and Roger Chapman, there were serious doubts that we could beat the Russians to the moon. But the so they start out with a flashback to Apollo 1, which I think is a really good a dramatic choice for the movie to remind us that Space travel is dangerous. People did die on this adventure. They don't talk a lot about what happened with Apollo 1. There was a lot of things that went wrong. Um, they had an electrical short. They, it turned out they had a lot of inflammable materials on board the ship. And it was especially prone to that because American spacecraft were pressurized with pure oxygen. The reason you do that is because you can pressurize it to a lower pressure, creating less stress on the hull. And just that partial pressure of oxygen is good enough for you to breathe. It does cause problems when people have to transition in and out because you can get the bends when you're exposed to nitrogen and so forth. The Russians pressurized their spacecraft with uh, normal air. So that created an environment where a spark could ignite an inferno. After this, what they did was they, was they started out with uh, a mix of nitrogen and oxygen on the ground. And as the spacecraft went up, they would slowly bleed the nitrogen out until it had a pure oxygen atmosphere. Uh, later in the movie, Jim Lovell talks about the what happened, and he mentioned specifically the hatch, that they couldn't get the hatch open when they needed to. What the Apollo 1 spacecraft had was a plug-type hatch. It's kind of similar to what you have on an airplane. If you've ever been on an airplane and you've seen the doors, when they close them, they're sort of shaped so that they press outward into the hull, and so that that pressure inside the airplane pushes against that and helps hold the door closed, which makes it very difficult, not impossible, but very difficult to open the door when you're in flight. The same thing, for the same reason, was done with the Apollo hatches. That Initially, they were a plug-type hatch, so that they were beveled that way so that they would be held shut by the air pressure so you wouldn't get an accidental opening. That turned out to be a catastrophe in this case because they couldn't get the hatch open. The overpressure of all that burning oxygen wedged the hatch in there so that it was literally impossible to open it. Now, the astronauts probably would have died anyway because of what was going on in the spacecraft, but that was identified as a key feature. And you'll notice, I'll show you when we get to it, that the hatch they used on the actual Apollo missions they launched was very different. And so that turned out to be a, a very big part of the catastrophe. Gus Grissom had kind of a star-crossed career. When he went up on the Mercury astronaut, the hatch on his spacecraft blew, and he barely escaped, and the hatch and the spacecraft sunk to the bottom of the ocean. And instead of getting ticker tape parades and getting to meet with the president, he got inquiry boards and people questioning his courage and saying he panicked and all that stuff. And it was, it was nonsense. The spacecraft was actually recovered decades later, and it showed that uh, there was no indication that he pulled a 
the hatch early. It may have just been a malfunction. But uh, then this was the second uh, tragedy that befell him when he was, was killed in Apollo 1. You can actually do that. Um, the moon subtends about half a degree on the sky and your thumb held out at arm's length, no matter how big you are or how small you are, subtends about two degrees because the ratio of the size of your thumb to the length of your arm is about a constant for most people. So your thumb is actually a little bit bigger than the moon, but you can actually cover it like that. Now put a pin in that. We're gonna come back to that in a, just a bit. Champagne. So one of the things I do like about this movie is it focuses a lot on Marilyn Lovell. As I was planning this, uh, I got news that Marilyn Lovell had passed away at a, a very ripe age. Um, her and Jim Lovell's marriage was one of the few to survive the space program. NASA wanted to have mostly married astronauts because they lived longer and had better health and were perceived to be more stable. But the space program in the early days was very hard on marriages. Of the original Mercury 7, three ended up divorced. Of the 30 astronauts who went into Gemini and Apollo, 23 ended up divorced. Now, there were several reasons for that. One is that it's a very hard life. It's very stressful. It's, you know, there's a lot of risk. There's a lot of pressure. They're away a lot of the time. And that's very hard on a marriage. There were also, to be honest, a lot of women who took great pride in sleeping with astronauts. And there were a lot of astronauts who were not averse to them uh, achieving those goals. But Marilyn and Jim Lovell's marriage was one of the few to really survive and thrive. An extraordinary woman, and I was very sad to hear about her past a couple weeks ago. Jim Lovell is still alive. I believe he is 90 years old, and uh, we still have him with us, fortunately. From now on, we live in a world where man has walked on the moon. It's not a miracle. We just decided to go. I love that line. Um, we just decided to go. It's almost impossible to describe what a miraculous achievement the Apollo program was. To go in 10 years from barely being able to go into orbit to being able to put a man on the moon with the resources we were able to develop. And it was a reminder that we can do really extraordinary things when we put our minds to it. The only thing comparable in my lifetime, and I hate to bring this up because I don't want to war in the comments, was the uh, COVID vaccines, which came out about nine months after the virus came out. To be fair, we had a little bit of a head start there because we developed a vaccine for the previous SARS versions, and uh, they had the genome, so they had the they could get the prototype vaccine within a couple of days. But uh, that's probably the closest to it, where we just decided we wanted to do something and just threw money at it until we could do it. I hope more people look to the Apollo program as an inspiration for when our nation can do great things when we just decide to do it. It's still one of the most extraordinary achievements in human history. The astronaut is only the most visible member of a very large team and all of us right down to the... Uh, the vehicle assembly building, I have actually been there. Um, when I was at Space Telescope, uh, I got to go to a shuttle launch and they gave us a, a tour of the entire facility. The vehicle assembly building is still one of the largest buildings in the world by volume and the largest building I have ever been in. It is extraordinary how big that building is. I, I don't think even a movie can convey in person just how monumental this building is. I mean, it's just an ordinary looking building, but it is so extraordinarily huge. It's amazing. Charlie Duke has the measles. So we need a new backup. You've all been exposed to it. Well, I've had the measles. Can't me, has it? You, you want to break up my crew two days before the launch? When we can predict each other's moves, we can read the, read the tone of each other's voices. Ken Mattingly will be getting seriously ill precisely when you and Hayes will be ascending from the lunar surface to rendezvous with him. Jim, that's a lousy time for a fever. Uh, now, now, look, Jack Swigert has been out of the loop for weeks. He's fully qualified to fly this mission. He's a fine pilot, but when was the last time he was in a simulator? All right, so one inaccuracy here is that there are a couple days before launch, the rocket would actually be on the pad at this point. It makes an impressive shot with it rolling by, but that is inaccurate. They would already be uh, on the pad getting tested and checked out. So to explain what happened here, there were two crews for Apollo 13. The primary one of Fred Hayes, Jim Lovell, and Ken Mattingly, and then the backup crew, John Young, Charlie Duke, and Jack Swagger. 
So what happened was Charlie Duke came down with what they thought was the measles, turned out to be German measles. So they've all been training together. They're all exposed to it. All these men were born before routine vaccination, so none of them been vaccinated. The only way to be immune from measles was to have had it. Ken Mattingly had not had the measles, all the others had. Now, maybe Mattingly had been exposed to it and just had been had an asymptomatic case. I was like that. I had, my brother and sister got chicken pox when we were kids, I never got it. But when I did a titer, when I was 18 years old, it showed I was immune. I got an asymptomatic case. Don't feel jealous, I got shingles a couple years ago, so that more than made up for it. With Charlie Duke gone, that means the backup crew is out. With Ken Mattingly gone, that means the primary crew is out. So what they had to do was mix and match, move Jack Swagger over to replace Ken Mattingly on the primary crew so they could assemble a crew from what they had. The alternative was to completely scrub the launch and go elsewhere because they didn't have any astronauts trained for the Framora Highlands or this mission or ready to go like this. This scene, I understand why they do it. This is a Hollywood scene. You got to create tension. You got to create some character drama. But this scene does not accurately reflect what happened. They didn't like that Ken Mattingly was being grounded. And as pilots, they regard flight surgeons with some suspicion. But that, what, that resentment was directed against the flight surgeon, not against Swagger himself. It actually turned out to be a bit of a blessing in disguise. Swagger was very versed in the command uh, service module. He'd studied it extraordinarily well. And so when the emergency happened, they couldn't have asked for a better pilot to be in the seat than Swagger. And they make it out to be like he's this rookie and no one trusts him. They were all new, except for Lovell, new to space flight. So that, that was not a big deal. And Swagger flew a, a perfectly fine mission. The other thing that, uh, about this scene, though, is I've actually met the doctor who is represented in this scene, and he kind of resents it because he feels that he was right, and I agree with him. Had They had no way of knowing that Ken Mattingly would not come down with the measles. Had he come down with the measles, you're talking about vomiting, diarrhea, in zero gravity. You're talking about a temperature of 104. People die of measles. People get extraordinarily sick of measles. It's, you know, for some people, it's just an irritation. For other people, it's very, very serious. And to the idea of sending someone up into space when a couple of days later, he could come down with a serious illness like that is insane. And the fact that Ken Mattingly never did get the measles and probably was uh, had had an asymptomatic case that made him immune does not make that the wrong decision. It was still the right decision based on the information they had at the time. All right. And he, he, you know, when I met this doctor, he made the point. Can you imagine with everything that went wrong on this mission, with the health challenges that were faced by the astronauts, which we'll get into in a little bit, if he had come down with the measles, if he'd been running a temperature of 104 and coughing and sneezing and potentially vomiting and all that stuff. No, this was the, absolutely the right decision. And this is one piece. I understand why they do it. You want to create some character tension in the movie, whatever. But I think the movie deviated from what really happened in a not necessarily good way. So there, there's that hatch. Do you see closes from the outside and then it has this complex locking mechanism. That was to avoid what happened with Apollo 1. This bit is a little inaccurate. All the, the, you have half of the attachments pull out at one moment and half of them pull out at the other. You wouldn't do it like this uh, and maybe tip the rocket over. Honestly, I could make a 30 minute video of me just watching this launch sequence and it is really well done, really close to what the Apollo 13 mission actually looked like. And I think 
probably one of the best five, 10 minute sequences that we've seen in movies for the space program. I just love every minute of this. I could watch it every day. That's the uh, mission abort system in case they needed to pull the capsule off the rocket. So uh, this is very accurate. This happened on the mission. It was a glitch that you have five engines on the second stage and the inner one went out. Post-flight investigation would show that this was the spacecraft responding correctly to a potentially dangerous situation where the feed into the engine was causing an oscillation in the fuel tank that could have ruptured it. But delta V is delta V. You just need to apply a certain amount of velocity. And as long as your those four engines burn longer, what they were checking on was that the onboard systems were compensating for that loss of engine just burning longer so they would get the delta V they needed to get into orbit. And so uh, that's fine. We had an incident like this actually relatively recently that got some attention. There was a rocket launch where when it launched, the rocket sort of hovered and went sideways and then went up. Um, what they had was they had a engine failure just like this, but they had a certain amount of overcompensation that the thrust to weight ratio was with one engine out was perfectly balanced. That's why the rocket hovered and went sideways. Once it began to burn off the fuel, it then went up and they actually had a successful failure because they got through uh, much of the launch and the guidance system responded to this pretty well, just like the guidance system did here. And uh, they did have eventually have to blow up the rocket because it went off course. But uh, a very similar situation where you had one engine one go off, but the other four were able to eventually compensate. So uh, you always try to have a degree of flexibility in space. Uh, you can't always, but you try to have some bit of redundancy, some bit of anticipation that something may fail. And uh, you don't want to have as many uh, single point failures if you can. That does happen in space. When you're in space, you're in free fall. I described how free fall works in my 2001 video. Our bodies are programmed by millions of years of evolution to think that falling is bad. And you are literally falling. You're falling around the earth in an orbit, but you're literally falling and your body will respond to it that way. Now, eventually the body adapts and feels more like you're floating than falling. And you know something we remember very basically from the womb where we were floating. And so you do get, actually get, most people get into that comfort zone where they're fine with it and in fact even enjoy it. But it can be a bit, a bit disorienting for a lot of people and throwing up is pretty common just because we have that instinct. And pitching up, pitch rate 2.5 degrees per second. Roger, Jack. Uh, I see you pitching around. Keep an eye on that telemetry. Roger that. Margaret can't dock this way and we don't have a mission. Okay, so they might try to make this a big deal of Jack parking the uh, service module with the LEM and being able to extract it and so forth. I mean, this is a particularly tense moment of the mission because it's a single point failure. If you don't dock, you don't have a mission. But it was no more tense with Swagger than it was with anyone else. I've demonstrated this before, but when you have, when you finish the launch, you have the third stage here. This is the LEM, and this is the command service module sitting on top of it. So you those fairings part away, and then the command service module goes out, turns around, 
docks with the limb and then pulls it off, hopefully not leaving the engine behind, and you go to the moon. Now, this actually did turn out to be a problem on Apollo 14, that when they first docked with the uh, limb, it didn't latch on. And they tried it a couple times, and then they spent a few hours trying to figure out what to do, and they eventually switched off some subsystem. Alan Shepard was on this mission. This was his return to space. And so he had this these crazy ideas of going faster and trying to latch onto it, and they were afraid he was going to damage it, or getting out there and manually putting them together, which they would never have planned for. Uh, it was, that actually was a tense moment because with Apollo 13 having just failed to get to the moon, if Apollo 14 had failed, that would have put the uh, rest of the program in serious jeopardy. But fortunately, it worked out. But in this case, it went just fine. Latched on, no problem. Now, before we get into the disaster, because it's about to happen in a, in a couple minutes, I do want to say one little inaccuracy that they get here, because I think there's a hero who needs to be recognized. They focus this on Gene Krantz as the mission uh, operations lead. And he was the lead, but there were actually four different mission operations team that were uh, monitoring Apollo 13. You had the gold team, the maroon team, the white team, and the black team. Gene Krantz headed the white team, and this happened while the maroon team was on shift, but they, after an hour they went off and the black team took over. The head of that team was Glenn Lunny, and it was actually him who took command in those critical hours afterward where they were making critical decisions. Ken Mattingly, who actually was on shift, not drinking in his apartment at that time, said it, uh, it was one of the most extraordinary displays of leadership he ever saw, that Lunny just took command of what was going on, calmed everyone down, got everyone focused on what they needed to do, and, uh, and that was probably one of the reasons why the Apollo 13 uh, crew survived. All four uh, teams got presidential medals uh, for their extraordinary uh, handling of this crisis, and all four deserved it. But I do want to single out Glenn Lunny because the focus on Krantz, you want to focus on one character in a movie. You don't want these four teams rotating in and out, and you have to get familiar with new characters every time, now and then. So that's fine. But I do want to say that uh, there was an unsung hero in this movie who should have been sung. Uh, we got a couple of housekeeping procedures for you. We'd like you to roll right to zero, six, zero, and know your rates. Roger that. Rolling right, zero, six, zero. And then if you could uh, give your oxygen tanks a stir. So the fatal cryo stir that happens here, just to explain what that is. Uh, you have these oxygen tanks, right? The, uh, you have this super compressed fluid in there, the, the oxygen It's uh, that uh, you're using for your reaction valves mixing with hydrogen to produce energy for the spacecraft and water for the spacecraft. And you, so what you have is these heaters in there to keep it from getting too cold. Now, normally when you're in gravity, that uh, you don't need to do anything. The hot oxygen rises and then uh, cools off and then sinks and you get this circulation through the tank from the heaters but you're in free fall. So what's gonna happen is you're gonna get all the warm, all the oxygen around the heater is gonna be warm and it's gonna get colder and colder and denser and denser as you get away from the heater. This can cause problems when you're trying to read how much oxygen you have because you'll get an inaccurate reading because the density is no longer uniform through the entire tank. So what they do is a cryo stir. They activate a fan that stirs the material around, makes the temperature more even so you get a more accurate reading on the oxygen tank. This is something that they had done routinely. And it just happened that they had a fault in one of the systems, and you're about to see what's going to happen. See O2 fans. That's circulating the material. Through the tanks. Whoa! Hey! Uh, this is Houston. Uh, say again, please. Houston, we have a problem. We have a main bus B undervolt. We've got a lot of thrust activity here, Houston. It just went offline. Oh, there's another master alarm, Houston. I'm checking the quad. Christ, there's no refresh valve. Maybe two quads. We've got a computer there is a lot I like about the next few minutes of the movie. When this disaster happened, it wasn't exactly clear what had happened. We don't have, NASA didn't have a little label that said oxygen tank has exploded. 
all you have are symptoms. All you have are telemetry and warning lights, and you have to figure out what has happened. The actual sequence took place over a much longer period of time. They've compressed it for the movie, but I love the way they go through the checklist of trying to figure out what has happened here, because it's not always exactly clear. I've been through spacecraft anomalies. Thankfully, nothing this dramatic, knock on wood. But when something goes wrong with a spacecraft, all you have are symptoms. All you have is telemetry. All you have are indications that don't say this is the problem, but these are the symptoms. And then you have to isolate it. You have to try different things. Let's try turning off this system. Let's try turning off this system. Let's try changing this parameter. Let's try changing that parameter until you actually can do through a process of elimination, figure out what has actually happened on board the spacecraft. And sometimes it goes disastrously wrong. The Hitomi spacecraft a couple of years ago uh, had a uh, started spinning and it turned out that it had programmed itself to automatically respond to an uncontrolled spin, but it had programmed itself the wrong way. So it kept spinning itself faster and faster until it tore itself apart. So uh, thankfully we've never had that happen, but uh, I do really like the way they go through this process of elimination, particularly with what's about to happen right now. Um, Flight, I recommend we uh, shut down the reactant valves of the fuel cells. What the hell good is that gonna do? If that's where the leak is, we can isolate it. We can isolate it there and we can save what's left in the tanks and we can run on the good cell. You close them, you can't open them again. You can't land on the moon with one healthy fuel cell. Gene, the Odyssey is dying. From my chair here, this is the last option. So let's just run through what they're doing here. The uh, spacecraft has three fuel cells. What you do is you feed oxygen and hydrogen into those fuel cells. It reacts. Oxygen and hydrogen make water, so you get a energy from that, and you get water for the spacecraft for cooling and for drinking. When this explosion went off, they weren't clear what had happened. And so they didn't know that an oxygen tank had exploded. And so what they thought was maybe there was a rupture in the fuel cells. That would make a little more sense. You have explosions going on there, so maybe that's where it happened. So if you shut off the fuel cells, that stops the leak, that stops the oxygen flowing into that damaged fuel cell, and then you can at least save the oxygen for the rest of the mission so that they can return safely. And it turned out that did not work, as you, as we see in the movie, that they try that and it, oxygen just keeps leaking because it turned out the oxygen tank had exploded and damaged the other one, and so they were leaking that way. Um, but this was an extraordinary move because, as he says, they lose the moon. NASA regulations were you have to have three operational fuel cells to land on the moon, one operational fuel cell, no moon. Absolutely correct to go with that, that situation. You do not want an underpowered mission landing on the moon and astronauts trying to turn in that situation. But I like this. They say, if this is the problem, if we had a rupture in the fuel cells, we can isolate it. We can stop the oxygen leaking out. That will allow us to return. At this point, landing on the moon is out of the question. And so they did that. It did not work. And so they eventually had to shut the Odyssey down and go into the limb as a lifeboat. But again, this is running through that process of elimination. Figure out where the problem is. Figure out where you can cut it off. You're losing oxygen. Where's the oxygen going? Stop the oxygen from going there. Oh, you're still losing oxygen. Now you have to have a backup plan. So I just really love that they preserved this in the movie because this is what NASA actually did in real life. They went through this process of elimination, figuring out what had happened. I think it's one of the things that makes this movie so good, ramps up the tension, ramps up the realism. I love that the movie respects its audience enough to walk through this process, to throw out these details, even if the audience doesn't necessarily understand what a fuel cell is or wouldn't know an oxygen atom from a uranium atom, you can follow along with what's going on. And so I really love a movie that respects its audience's intelligence. And the movie made a lot of money and was very popular for that, so. 13 astronauts may be in grave danger. No, don't give me that nasty. <laughs> I want to know what's happening with my husband. I love NASA. It's a great agency. The people I work with there are extraordinary. It still does amazing things. But when you've worked with NASA, the phrase NASA <laughs> takes on a whole new meaning. I told you to put a pin in that. The bat thumb thing wouldn't work unless you held your thumb much closer to the to your face. When you look at the Earth from the moon, it is four times bigger in the sky than when you look at the moon from the Earth. The Earth is much larger than the moon. I mean, four in each dimension, so that way. So you could not actually cover it with your thumb unless you held it close to your face. So a little bit of an accuracy, but I do love that movie moment. It hurts when I urinate. We're not getting enough water. I'm drinking my ration the same as you. I think old Swagger gave me the clap. 
believe too. Fred Hayes actually did get very sick on the mission. Uh, it was not the clap. It was a prostate urinary infection. He was severely dehydrated because they could have very small water rations. Remember, they turned off the fuel cells, so you're not getting water from those hydrogen-oxygen reactions. So you have very limited supply of water. He got dehydrated. He got a prostate urinary infection. And the thing they show later where Lovell puts his arms around him and sort of rubs him like that to keep him warm. Lovell uh, talked about that, how... Um, Fred got so feverish and uh, got such bad chills that he actually did put his arms around him and sort of tried to warm him up that way. It was bad enough having him. Again, imagine if Ken Mattingly was in the other compartment with a uh, fever 104 as well. So we had a CO2 filter problem on the limb module. Five filters on the limb, which were meant for two guys for a day and a half. So I told the doctor. They're already up to eight on the gauges. Anything over 15 and you get impaired judgment, blackouts, the beginnings of brain asphyxia. What about the scrubbers on the command module? They take square cartridges. The ones on the limb are round. <laughs> Tell me this isn't a government operation. This just isn't a contingency we've remotely looked at. Those CO2 levels are going to be getting toxic. Well, I suggest you gentlemen invent a way to put a square peg in a round hole. What the uh, spacecraft use, what spacecraft still use today, what even submarines use, uh, for getting rid of carbon dioxide is a scrubber that has lithium hydroxide in it. Uh, carbon dioxide enters, it reacts with the lithium hydroxide, and water uh, comes out of that. There is a certain reaction rate in that lithium hydroxide canister, so that if you're getting too much carbon dioxide being breathed out and not enough going through the canister, you're going to fill with carbon dioxide and people will start to die. Um, and the ones for the limb were circular, the ones for the uh, command service module were square, and they did jury rig this thing to connect the square uh, scrubber from the uh, uh, command service module to the uh, canister, and so they could do it. Another part of the movie I really love because it is both really accurate and really tense and really, uh, again, respects the intelligence of the audience to understand what's going on, and uh, so I really uh, I love this part. If they're too steep, they'll incinerate in the steadily thickening air. If they're too shallow, they'll ricochet off the atmosphere like a rock skipping off a pond. The reentry corridor is in fact so narrow that if this basketball were the earth and this softball were the moon and the two were placed 14 feet apart, the crew would have to hit a target no thicker than this piece of paper. Okay, that, 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 that can't be right, can it? All right, that is accurate if you should hold the piece of paper sideways. He seems to imply that it's like that thinness if you hold the paper edge on, but it's actually if you hold it this way. The corridor would be about seven inches wide is what I calculate for a, a two degree window. Um, that's 180th of a circle, so it's actually pretty big. But it, it is right that the uh, that's a fairly narrow corridor and uh, what happens if you miss it, either skipping off the earth like a rock or burning up in the atmosphere is very accurate. So it was a very narrow window that they had to aim for. There it is, I see it. Oh. Houston, we're getting a first look at the service module now. One whole side of the spacecraft is missing. Right by the high gate antenna, a whole panel has blown out. Right up, right up to our heat shield. Uh, copy that, Aquarius. Oh, they've got the engine bell, too. Can you see that? Oh, man, that's incredible. So, I, I, I mean, this is, uh, of course, 100% accurate. I actually um, have run this scene, as I'd have several scenes, side by side with the transcript, so you can see how they tweaked it a little bit for the movie to emphasize the heat shield and the danger there. The heat shield was the most extraordinary was the most important part of this process that, as I said many times, as you come in, you're compressing the air, it superheats, it starts to ablate the spacecraft. If you don't have an intact sh heat shield, you're never gonna make it, as we found out with Columbia. When they finally got a look at the damage of the spacecraft, it really vindicated the decision to do the free return trajectory that they talk about in the movie, where they just follow their current path, go around the moon and return to Earth, rather than igniting the engine on the service module and trying a direct abort to return to Earth because with the damage that had been done, probably the whole spacecraft would have exploded or it wouldn't have lit at all. 
So uh, I, I do think that's a really important part to keep in the movie and uh, a really extraordinary moment for a NASA space program. So at this point in the movie, they're hitting the atmosphere and they talk about radio blackout. Again, I talked about that superheated plasma you get from the compressed air. That creates a, a huge amount of noise that prevents communication between the spacecraft and the ground. So as they say in the movie, uh, if they, they wouldn't have heard the screams of the astronauts or anything like that if it, it had failed, all they would have heard was a silence. Um, um, I need a minute here. <laughs> um, the ending of this movie always gets me. Um, I rarely get really um, emotional about sad parts of movies because, I mean, they're sad. I, I appreciate them. It really gets me are moments like this, um, moments of hope and triumph over adversity and people coming together and all that stuff. Um, so I do. I, that's, yeah, I, <laughs> I have to give me a minute here. So in terms of scientific accuracy, look, this is a zero or one facepalm movie. They got so much right and went so into the technical details of this. Again, as I've said several times, respecting the intelligence of their audience to follow along with what was going on. And really, it's impossible to tell the story of Apollo 13 without getting into the weeds like that. They did take a little bit of liberties with the dialogue and with the character moments and so forth, trying to build up some tension and Hollywoodize it. But I'm not really going to knock off points for that because you, you have to have some drama that people can latch onto in a movie. I think this is the gold standard of uh, having your details right, respecting the intelligence of the audience, and uh, making it as accurate as you can while still keeping a lot of drama flowing through it and so forth. The thing I like most about this movie is it really gets to one of the really good things about NASA, which is that it is filled with people who think every problem has a solution and will do whatever they can to solve a problem that presents itself. As for the movie itself, look, this is a as this is one of my favorite movies of all time, probably in the top ten. I, I just love everything about this movie. The acting is fantastic. Uh, great performances from everyone involved. Uh, great directing from Ron Howard. Uh, fantastic score from, uh, I think it's James Horner, that uh, you know has those exciting moments when you're launching and those tense moments when the spacecraft explode. And of course, brings the tears at the end when you get the uh, landing on the, uh, the spacecraft. Um, just a, an extraordinarily well done movie. And this was a movie where they filmed scenes on the vomit comet this is the uh airplane that goes up in the air and then drops down uh to give free fall and it can give you 40 seconds or a minute of free fall and so they would do it in these short takes uh not all of the scenes use that some of them just use staging to make it look like they're in space but uh i think that gives it a verisimilitude that uh really brings you into the movie and drags you in and i applaud ron howard and his crew for uh doing that because it must have been a huge challenge for the crew, for the actors, for the director to do that, where you go up and then you have to set up and you have a very short time to film before you have to cut and the and the airplane levels off. So just extraordinarily well done with those scenes. As I said in a previous video, if I know what's going to happen in a movie and I'm still on the edge of my seat, you've done something extraordinary. I think this is easily the best movie Ron Howard has made. And he's made some really good ones. And uh, but this is the best one he's made. And uh, I think one of the best movies in the 1990s easily. And so uh, glad to walk through it with you guys to geek out a little bit on the science and also talk about the accuracy of this movie and why I think it stands with, say, maybe 2001 or something like that, as the movie directors should look to when they want to make science oriented movies and get the science right and respect their audience. And I think the accuracy of this movie, the fact that they get those details right, is one of the things that makes it good. You know, if they were saying, oh, we have to twist the phenobulator and so forth and having all this inaccurate stuff, I think it would take away from the movie. I think it would throw people out of the realism. Whereas when they have these things that happened, when they have the details as they were on the spacecraft, when they have even some of the dialogue reflecting what was said, it brings you in. It 
uh, suspends that disbelief. It makes you forget that you're watching actors on a screen and think that you're actually watching the mission of Apollo 13. And one of the reasons uh, that it pays off so well. So uh, wonderful to walk through this movie. Uh, I've talked in previous uh, episodes about the limb and other things. So I have another couple things planned for the weeks ahead. In the meantime, I'm Mike Siegel. I write for Ordinary Times. Thank you for watching. There is a lot I love about the next few minutes of the movie. Will you stop that? External DVD, it just likes to make noise. It's about to have a baby DVD player. All right.